So, once they explode, stars aren't supposed to come back to life. But some of the stars somehow have survived the great supernova explosion. Such zombie stars are pretty rare. Scientists found a really big one called LP4365. It's a partially burnt white dwarf. Now, a white dwarf is a star that has burned up all of the hydrogen, and that hydrogen was previously its nuclear fuel. In this case, the final explosion was maybe weaker than it usually is, not powerful enough to destroy the entire star. It's like a star wanted to explode but didn't make it, which is why part of the matter still survived. One of those zombie stars used to be a white dwarf or just left over from an explosion. It gobbled up too much from another star and, surprisingly, managed to explode once again. If you manage to go to the moon one day and see fresh footprints, that doesn't mean there's someone else there with you. Footprints or similar marks can last for a million years over there because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. There are no winds, not even a breeze, that can slowly erase those footprints. In outer space, you'd be strong enough to weld two pieces of metal together with your own hands. Okay, it has nothing to do with your strength. You could just press them together with no effort, and that's it. Oxygen in our atmosphere makes a thin layer on the surface of the metal. It's like a barrier, which is why such a trick is impossible on Earth, but perfectly logical in outer space. If you ever go to space, don't take off your spacesuit unless you're on a spaceship. Air in your lungs would expand, as well as the oxygen in the rest of your body. You'd be like a balloon, twice your regular size. Good news? The skin is elastic enough to hold you together, which means you wouldn't explode. Yeah, small comfort, huh? If you watch a very touching movie in space and start crying, your tears won't run down. They will gather around your eyeballs. Your eyes will get too dry, so you'll feel like they're burning. Any exposed liquid on your body will vaporize, including the surfaces of your tongue. Speaking of burning, there's one thing fire can't do in space. Fire can spread when there's a flow of oxygen, and since there's not any in space. If the fire breaks out in a rocket, you can simply turn off the ventilation system and voila! It can get more complicated if there's intense smoke, sparking, and material melting in conditions of reduced gravity. Regular foam fire extinguishers we use on Earth are useless here because they release foam randomly. Researchers are developing a fire extinguisher that will put out fires by using sound waves. The bigger the sound intensity, the bigger the flame they can put out. But the astronauts might end up deaf if their frequency is too high. A black hole is not like some starving monster that wanders around and has gravity so strong nothing can really escape it. When something comes close to the point of no return, which we also call the event horizon, it disappears. No way back. But quantum physics claims nothing can really destroy data. So it's a true paradox. Stephen Hawking was the one with the idea of how black holes don't really have event horizons. Maybe they have apparent horizons. Those trap things for some time only. After that, the trapped energy will somehow get away, but in a different form. When something goes into a black hole, it changes shape and gets stretched out just like spaghetti. It happens because gravitational force is trying to stretch an object in one direction, but at the same time squeeze it in another. Like a pasta paradox. Speaking of, a black hole that's as big as a single atom has the mass of a really big mountain. There's one at the center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A. It has a mass like 4 billion suns, but luckily it's far away from us. There are more than 23,000 pieces of so-called space junk bigger than a softball floating above our planet at speeds up to 17,500 miles per hour. Woo! And there are 500,000 pieces in general, some of them the size of a marble. Space waste is generally debris made up of natural particles called meteoroids and artificial particles, like things we make on the Earth. Meteoroids orbit the Sun while the majority of human-made debris orbits our planet. For example, we launched almost 9,000 spacecraft around the world, from satellites to rocket ships. Even the tiniest pieces can damage a spacecraft at such high speeds. 
Galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, stars, space bodies are things we can actually see in space. But they make up less than 5% of the total universe. Dark matter, one of the biggest mysteries in space, is the name we use for all the mass in the universe that's still invisible to us. There's a lot of it. It may even make 25% of the universe. Dark energy makes the rest of the 70% of the universe. Scientists don't know much about it, but they think dark energy could be behind the increasing expansion of the entire universe, while dark matter slows it down. Dark matter doesn't interact with us in any way that we know of, nor does it interact with itself. If it did, we might be able to find dark matter galaxies, dark matter planets, or such objects. Now, astronomers have found the largest hole we've ever seen in the universe. It's the giant void that spreads a billion light years across. They found it accidentally. One of the research team members was a little bit bored and wanted to check out how things were going in the direction of the cold spot. That's an anomaly in the cosmic microwave background map, or in short, CMB. It's a faint glow of light that falls on our planet from different directions and fills the universe. It's been streaming through space for almost 14 billion years as the afterglow that occurred after the Big Bang. But instead of CMB, they realized there's a giant area way colder than they'd expected. The team started tracking radio signals, but there were no radio sources in that whole volume. That means there are no galaxies or clusters, and since it's so cold, there's no dark matter either, or regular matter. So it really doesn't matter. The giant void is empty. And researchers think it could consist of dark energy. Light can still pass through it. It's not the only void in space, but it's the biggest one we've found. The area around a star is habitable when it's not too cold or too hot for liquid water to exist on the planet surrounding it. Let's say our planet was where Pluto is. It's too far from the sun, which means our ocean and big parts of its atmosphere would freeze. But if the Earth was in Mercury's place, we'd be too close to the Sun, and the water on our planet would evaporate. Such habitable area is called the Goldilocks Zone. So you can see where planets are located and assume if they have a chance for life on their surface. But Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, definitely breaks the rule. It's outside of the Goldilocks Zone, but still kept warm. Not from the Sun directly, but Jupiter and its moons that actually pump energy into Europa. Europa changes its shape as it circles around Jupiter. It's similar to tides rising and falling on our planet. Water on the Earth changes its shape as a response to the tidal forces of our moon. When the same happens with a solid object, the object is stressed. That's how you pump energy into that object. It's like you're playing racquetball. You hit the ball around a couple of times before you start playing like you're warming it up. You kind of distort the ball every time you smack it. The surface of Europa is frozen, but it has cracks in the ice. You can see ridges in the ice where there's a crack. Then those flying chunks shift and refreeze. You'd see a similar thing if you could fly over the Arctic Ocean in the wintertime. There are ice sheets constantly breaking and refreezing. So Europa can't completely freeze. Scientists think there could be an ocean of liquid water under the icy surface. Europa is not the only moon where this is happening. Another of Jupiter's moons, Io, is also warm because of such tidal forces. Io also has volcanoes erupting from within all the time. So it's not only that the Sun warms the space bodies and pumps them with energy. Many experts agree the universe might come to its end about 3 to 22 billion years from now. It's expanding all the time, which means it formed from a compact state. If it has a beginning, it's probably going to have an end as well. Yeah, I won't be around for that. One of the popular theories says the growth will slow down, and gravity will become the powerful force that will make the universe shrink. That will lead to complete chaos. Galaxies, stars, planets, space bodies, they will all move, collide, and, you know, destroy one another. It's like the reverse Big Bang. Huge chaos, but this time, everything collapses. Well, on that cheery note, always stay on the bright side of life. So, do you know why the ocean is salty? We didn't know the reason until 1979. The whole planet is covered with ocean, and we had no idea where all that salt comes from. 
We initially thought rivers were to blame because they can carry deposits and chemicals to the still waters. It wasn't until the late 1970s when scientists stumbled upon so-called black smokers that we realized they were the cause of the salty waters. They are, in fact, geothermal vents located along the mid-ocean ridge. They were generated from sediments of iron sulfide from deep within the Earth's core. Okay, remember dinosaurs? I don't. I wasn't around then. But they disappeared a long time ago. Yet how that happened was still up for debate within the scientific community for a very long time. Up until 1991, no less, the year the Chicxulub Crater was discovered. That's a big hole located underneath the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Many claim it was formed when a giant asteroid crashed on Earth. The oldest material ever found on our planet turns out to be older than our entire solar system. The Murchison meteorite plopped into Australia back in September 1969. But we made this staggering discovery after a newer analysis of its debris was done only in 2020. Did you know that there is a coral skyscraper hidden underneath the ocean and we had no idea? Only in 2020, a team of Australian scientists stumbled upon it when mapping the northern Great Barrier Reef. It's 1,640 feet tall, which, if you think about it, makes it taller than the Empire State Building. And no elevators. Do you know how mountains appeared? We didn't know that until 1966. And that also concerns earthquakes and volcanoes. Just think about it, we sent men into space before we even understood how and why the Earth under our feet started moving now and then. Only in 1966, a scientist named J. Tuzo Wilson published a piece in the journal Nature in which he explained that continents and oceans are constantly moving. He also wrote about tectonic activity, meaning things like earthquakes and how mountains rose from the Earth's surface. Until 2021, we hadn't mapped out a full human genome sequence. The concept of DNA was first presented by a Swiss scientist back in 1869. But specialists remained partially in the dark as to DNA's physical structure until Rosalind Franklin and Raymond Gosling took pictures of it and found it looked like two twisting strands. Ever wonder what the largest living organism in the world was? For a long time, scientists did too, because they only stumbled upon it in 2000. It's a fungus that lives 3 feet underground, but is estimated to spread across 2,200 acres. Located in the Malheur National Forest in the Blue Mountains of eastern Oregon, it's named the honey mushroom. Until 2002, we didn't know what was at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. We knew we were rotating around something, but it took us until the 21st century to figure out it was a supermassive black hole, with a mass 4 million times bigger than our Sun, located in a region of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A star. The discovery took place after we came up with the infrared smoke alarm. I can hardly imagine having to travel long distances without wheeled luggage, but these didn't pop up until 1970. If you think about it, the astronauts who went to the moon actually had to carry their baggage in the spaceship physically. The application for the U.S. patent for the wheeled luggage was granted back in 1972. But to be fair, those first ones weren't exceptionally reliable. They had problems like wobbling and tipping because the large suitcases were mounted on narrow wheeled bottoms. If you look at pictures of 1940s film stars, you'll see that their hair was nice and slicked back. Did you know that based on recent discoveries, even ancient Egyptians used some hair-molding substance? What they used, though, wasn't hair gel, if that's what you're thinking, because we only came up with this invention in the 1960s. What people used for hairstyling back then in the 1940s was called Brill Cream, which had more of a waxy consistency and was invented in 1929. Hair gel, as we know it today, came a bit later and was invented by a man named Louis Montoya. It soon became trendy because it wasn't as greasy as previous products. Speaking of bathrooms, and I am about to, back in ancient Roman times, they used some sort of, uh, well, wiping devices. But they were sticks with a sponge on top. Individually perfumed sheets of paper that had the same purpose appeared to have been documented in China back in 589 CE. 
However, in the US, medicated paper for the water closet was marketed in the late 1850s. But the soft and comfortable variant of toilet paper was commercialized only in the 1930s, with the added bonus of being completely splinter-free. And I think we can all appreciate that. This one may not seem so recent, but hear me out. Modern research revealed that Saturn's rings are less than 100 million years old or so. That may seem like a lot, but if you think that the solar system formed about 4.5 billion years ago, it does shift your perception a bit, right? There are species of sharks on Earth that have been around in our waters four times longer than Saturn's rings. We figured this out using recent data regarding the mass of Saturn's rings and their ratio of dust and ice. With many of us resorting to e-commerce more and more these days, it's challenging to look at the traditional supermarket as some revolutionary invention. But we didn't have these for as long as you'd think, either. Do you know how the first supermarket appeared? Well, back in 1916, a shop owner named Clarence Saunders needed a solution to make his job less labor-intensive, since shopping around then meant he had to pick out all the products from the aisles and even deliver them to customers. So he thought about a new shop layout with a turnstile entry. People had to browse the shop in a single direction. He also made sure they were passing by all the available products. Customers could pick their items themselves and had to take their produce home. The shop owner could lower his prices with added efficiency, since he needed fewer people to run the business. Did you know there's still a state in the US where wearing a seatbelt isn't mandatory? Historically, using a seatbelt was voluntary. But people being the way they were, safety needed some enforcement. The state of New York was the first one to pass a law that enforced seatbelt wearing while driving, but only on December 1, 1984. Still, to this day in New Hampshire, there are no laws on the matter. The modern can opener, the one with the spinning wheel, was first introduced to the market in 1870. Now, that may not be remarkable, but it seems odd when you think canned foods were already available for some decades. Before this invention, we were told to literally cut around the top of the can near the outer edge with a chisel and hammer. You got a meal and an excellent workout all in one. Did you know that standardized time became enforceable by law only in 1880? The current system that we use now, GMT, for Greenwich Mean Time, became a common practice in most countries even later, somewhere by the end of the 1920s. Now, we used to estimate what time it was by looking at the sun's position in the sky. We then evolved to using clocks, but they were still dependent on the sun's position in a particular town or village. That meant time could differ slightly between two neighboring communities. And it wasn't that big of a deal for us until the invention of trains. As we started to travel faster and on longer distances, we needed to figure out a way to know when a train would leave and reach a certain destination, which could be helpful for all travelers in various locations. And frankly, it was about time. We're traveling a thousand light years from our planet to an unfamiliar system. Here, there are two bright stars orbiting close to each other. But there is one small but very massive thing here as well a black hole. These objects are mysterious and dangerous. They're capable of swallowing our entire world in one second without even noticing it. Even more, they can tear apart a huge star like our Sun. And it's these giants that usually lie at the centers of galaxies. They're so heavy that their gravity holds countless stars, planets, and stardust around them. They can weigh millions or even billions of times more than the Sun. And now, you're back on the ground at a rocket launch pad on Earth. All you can think about is holding your breath and jumping into the heart of that black pearl. But you don't have to hold your breath because you'll be in a spacesuit, and the oxygen is included free of charge. Besides, you're not likely to ever make it to the black hole. A trip that far with the technology we have now would take tens of thousands of years. Back to your garage where you stashed your hyper rocket, which will take you to the black hole in seconds. And you're next to two stars in a black hole. First thing you notice is that the black holes aren't black. Its gravitational force pulls in not only objects, but even light itself. 
This makes the hole invisible. You can only see a bright ring around it. That's called the event horizon. It consists of twisted light, hot dust, plasma, and pieces of asteroids that are also trapped there. So the event horizon is the first obstacle to overcome. Okay, you put on your jetpack, open your rocket's door, and jump towards the black hole. The force of gravity begins to pull you quickly toward it. The spacesuit protects you from the enormous temperatures and levels of radiation on the event horizon. Conventional protective gear would hardly help you. So you thank your dad for stashing this super-powerful protective suit in your garage as well. You begin to feel like your body's stretching unpleasantly. The problem is that gravity increases with every inch closer to the center of the black hole. And it's much stronger at your head than at your feet. Your body starts to stretch like spaghetti. That's why it's called spaghettification. No suit can protect you from that. And there isn't a single spaceship that can withstand that kind of strain. Well, this was a short video. Okay, let's rewind to the moment before the jump. You realize that to get to the heart of the black hole and survive, you don't need improved equipment, but another black hole. And it's the size and weight of it that matters here. Theoretically, you can survive falling into a supermassive black hole. It's all about the width of the black hole's event horizon. When a hole is small, about the weight of our sun, the event horizon is small too. And then its edge is remarkably close to the center of the abnormal gravitational force, which would make you spaghettified quickly and uh, brutally. But if the event horizon is wide, it's farther from the center of the gravitational force. Then the difference of gravity pressing on your head and feet will be non-existent. So if you have enough air in your spacesuit, you can survive such a journey. So you must pick a supermassive black hole. Hmm, let's see. One at the center of the Milky Way? No, there's too much hot plasma and debris around it. You need a completely isolated black hole for a jump like this. Somewhere in dark space where it hasn't had time to gather the debris of neighboring worlds around it. You quickly open your space map and find such a black hole. One faster than light trip and you've arrived. There it is! A huge dark nothing. There's only distorted light from distant stars and galaxies on its event horizon. To test your theory, you throw a mannequin into it. It approaches the black hole and then slows to a standstill. But it's just an illusion. The black hole is so heavy, it can warp both space and time. So to the observer, the dummy is frozen in the event horizon. But it has long since entered its heart. The dummy didn't get spaghettified like you did when you fell into a small black hole. So now you're confidently jumping after it. Remember that even if you feel fine, it's still a one-way trip. Once in the black hole's field of attraction, nothing can escape its embrace. No matter how powerful a rocket you have or how hard you flap your arm. You're now at the edge of the accretion disk. Every second here equals weeks or months on Earth. You're traveling through time. Our home planet may already have flying cars and skyscrapers several miles tall all over the place. But for you, it's only a couple of minutes. Whoa! All the light you see from the stars has turned red. That too is because of gravity. The light we see is waves, but the black hole stretches them out. The short wavelengths of blue become long and red. Great! You've passed the event horizon and are now heading into black nothingness. You look up and see a thin ray of light. The last thing you see, in fact. After that, there's just black void. No one knows what happens next. Some theories say black holes can be portals to another dimension or to another place in the universe. By jumping into a black hole in our galaxy, you can jump hundreds of thousands of light years away from our home. In that case, you will experience your fall in reverse. First, you see a small but expanding beam of light. Then, red starlight returns to blue. And before you know it, you're back on the event horizon. And soon after, you're free of the black hole's pool. But scientists still can't confirm this theory. Okay, that's too grim. 
So just this time, we'll bring you back to Earth in the company of your friends. They praise you for your accomplishment of surviving the center of a black hole. Now you're the heart of the company, and no black hole can scare you. But even the biggest black hole in space isn't as scary as you might think. They have a lifespan. That radiation I mentioned takes energy from the black hole. If it doesn't have food around it, the hole starts to deflate like a balloon. And eventually, there's nothing left. Another fear around black holes is that we can create one at home. Indeed, inside the Large Hadron Collider, scientists conduct experiments with small particles colliding at high speed. There are huge bursts of energy. And some scientists believe this energy is enough to create a microscopic black hole. It will begin to absorb its surroundings and grow. First, some small objects in the room where it was created. Then, the entire lab. The hole continues to grow and is already consuming our whole planet. It changes the balance of power in our solar system and absorbs the planets one by one. When those are finished, it's time for dessert. The sun! The light upper layers of plasma are stretched into long spaghetti and pulled toward the black hole. Then, layer by layer, our star collapses into the dark abyss. When the sun is half absorbed, the black hole shoots a beam of energy and light outwards and continues to consume the sun. In mere moments, there's nothing left of our solar system. That's how some people describe the end of the world. But even if we do manage to create a microscopic black hole, we'll be safe. It'll be too small to absorb big objects, and it will only feed on small atomic particles. Black holes emit energy as well as consume it, so our little one won't have time to grow. It'll lose more than it finds in a fraction of a second. So what you'll see is a momentary flash and then nothing. Although creating a stable and controlled black hole may even be useful, they emit enormous amounts of energy that we can use. A black hole the mass of Mount Everest could power all of humanity. Of course, black holes are still dangerous. But we can watch them and study our universe. If we stay far enough away, of course. So, you decide to put a padlock on that garage door. For now. <laughs>